This is the first part of a series of lectures covering incoherent scatter radar measurement techniques. In this first part, we will derive the radar equation for volume filling ionospheric plasma as a radar target, which describes the received power of a radar echo. Using the radar equation, we will explore what determines the ratio of radar echo power to receiver noise power for an ionospheric radar measurement. This signal-to-noise power ratio is a key factor in determining the quality of a radar measurement for ionospheric plasma parameters. Incoherent scatter radars measure radar echoes from ionospheric plasma. The power spectrum of these radar echoes is described by the theory for incoherent scatter of electromagnetic waves from plasma. This theory was derived in the early 60s by several authors, including Donald Farley and Thor Hogforce. The theory is very precise and it allows us to determine the ionospheric plasma parameters from a radar measurement. Observing ionospheric plasma parameters is therefore the primary objective of incoherent scatter radar measurements. The incoherent scatter radar technique is often the best method for observing ionospheric plasma parameters using a ground-based instrument. However, in order to apply this technique, very large and powerful radars are needed because the scattering cross-section of ionospheric plasma is very small. The figure above shows the two main features of an incoherent scatter spectrum. On the left hand side, you can see the portion that corresponds to ion acoustic waves. This part contains information about electron density, electron temperature, ion temperature, ion velocity, and ion mass. This feature of the spectrum is called the ion line. On the right-hand side, you can see the radar echo corresponding to electron plasma waves. When the radar observes parallel to the magnetic field, this spectral feature corresponds to radar echoes from electron Langmuir waves. This feature is often called the plasma line. The plasma line contains very precise information about electron density, as it is a sharp spectral feature, roughly at a Doppler offset to the radar center frequency that corresponds to the plasma frequency, omega p. A measurement of the frequency offset of the plasma line is therefore a measurement of electron density. I will now show an example of a measurement of the incoherent scatter spectrum using the Arecibo Observatory 430 MHz radar, shown in this picture. This plot shows scattered power as a function of frequency and range. In the middle of the plot, you can see the ion line roughly centered at the radar transmit frequency, omega f. To the right and left of the ion line, you can see the up and down shifted plasma lines. The range resolution of this measurement is 300 meters, and the frequency resolution roughly 2 kilohertz. By zooming in, we can therefore see the true resolution of this measurement. This portion of the range Doppler spectrum shows the E region of the ionosphere. This portion shows the F1 region of the ionosphere, and this portion the F2 region peak. We can follow the plasma line all the way up to the top side of the ionosphere. The middle of the spectrum shows the ion line. However, the resolution of this measurement does not allow us to observe the double humped spectrum. The measurement of upshifted plasma line is nearly identical to the downshifted plasma line. I will now show an example of ionospheric plasma parameters derived from the ion line portion of the incoherent scatter spectrum. The observation I will show is made using the ISCAT VHF radar in Tromso, which is shown in the picture. The plots in the figure show the standard derived data products, electron density, electron temperature, ion temperature, and ion velocity, as a function of altitude and time. This specific measurement shows auroral precipitation, which is indicated by enhanced electron density at lower altitudes. The plot on the lower right shows some other parameters, such as radar pointing direction, transmit power, as well as system noise temperature as a function of time. The main objective of this lecture is to understand different factors that determine the signal-to-noise power ratio of an incoherent scatter radar measurement. We'll start by deriving the equation for received radar power from a volume of ionospheric plasma, which is given in equation 1. The relevant parameters that we will be using here are 
P sub R received power, P sub T transmitted radar power, G sub T the transmit antenna gain, A sub R the receiver antenna effective area, R sub I range from the transmitter to the target, R sub S range from the target to the receiver, V sub S the scattering volume, sigma the scattering cross section per unit volume, and sine squared of chi a polarization term which arises due to scattering from electrons and plasma in a bistatic radar geometry. We'll start by determining the amount of power per unit area delivered by the radar transmitter to the volume of plasma at range R. On the left hand side you can see the case for an isotropic radiator. In this case the amount of power is evenly distributed over the surface of a sphere. At a distance of R the amount of power per unit area is transmitted power P divided by 4 pi R squared the area of a sphere at distance r. This is in units of watts per square meter. A large radio antenna allows focusing of power into a narrow solid angle in space. The ability of a radio antenna to focus power into a certain direction is described by antenna gain. I've assumed no losses within the antenna, in which case if you integrate gain over the unit sphere in solid angle, the integrated antenna gain evaluates to 4 pi you obtain the same value when integrating over a solid angle using the isotropic radiator on the left. This means that the energy is conserved. Both antennas radiate the same amount of power, but a large directive antenna can focus this power into a small solid angle. We now have an expression for incident power per unit area arriving to a volume in space at range Ri. We focus on the region of the antenna gain pattern where the gain is maximized. Let us now investigate the scattering process by investigating the scattering of electromagnetic waves by electrons in the volume of plasma illuminated by the radar transmitter. Because electrons in ionospheric plasma interact weakly with electromagnetic waves at frequencies used for incoherent scatter radar, only a small fraction of the incident power is scattered. We can therefore ignore the effects of multiple scattering and assume that incident power is constant throughout the scattering volume. This is known as the Born approximation. If we investigate scattering from individual electrons, ignoring collective interactions between the constituents of plasma, the scattering is described by Thomson scatter. We will use this to demonstrate polarization effects that arise during the scattering process. The incident electric field of the transmitted radio wave will cause the electron to oscillate. The oscillating electron will radiate a small fraction of the incident power. This scattering process can be described by modeling the electron as a short dipole. The scattered power per solid angle in this case is given by equation 2. This includes the classical electron radius squared, the incident power S sub i, and sine squared chi, where chi is the angle between the electric field and the direction towards the receiver. This equation considers a linearly polarized incident electric field. If the transmitter and receiver are co-located, then chi is pi over 2 and sine squared of chi is 1. In this case, the scattered power is maximized. If the receiver is located in such a way that chi is 0, then no power is scattered towards the receiver on that polarization. Incoherent scatter radars usually employ circularly polarized transmissions, which consist of two orthogonal components of electric field. In this case, we need to consider the scattering effects for both polarization components of the signal, which can behave differently. Consider for example the case where we have a circularly polarized incident radio wave, which has an EX and EY electric field component. Assuming that the EX component is aligned towards the direction of the receiver, none of the EX component is scattered towards the receiver. However, the Y component of the electric field is scattered. In this case, the Y component of the electric field is directed into the page. And in this case, chi sub Y is pi over 2, and sine squared chi of Y is 1. In this case, one component of the circularly polarized incident wave is lost in the scattering process. 
In general, the process of scattering creates a polarizing effect for bistatic geometries, where the transmitter is located at a different geographic location than the receiver. The scattered signal is then collected by the radar receiver. The scattered power is given as power per solid angle directed towards the receiver. In order to determine the amount of power collected by the receiver antenna, we need to integrate over the solid angle of the receiver antenna, sigma sub r. Here, r sub s is the distance between the scattering volume and the receiver antenna. The received power can now be obtained by multiplying the solid angle of the radio receiver antenna with the scattered power per unit of solid angle. By using the equation for Thomson scatter, we arrive at equation 4. If we now insert the expression for incident power S sub i, which we obtained earlier, we arrive at expression 6. Finally, using the Born approximation, we can add up power from all of the scattering electrons within the volume of plasma by multiplying the volume with the number of electrons per unit volume. This now gives us equation 7, which provides total scattered power from within the volume of plasma. And now we have arrived at an expression for received radar power from a volume of the ionosphere. If we combine the scattering cross-section of a single electron with the electron density, we can obtain a radar cross-section per unit volume with units of 1 per meter. This expression for sigma, however, needs to be revised a little bit. The equation is only valid for very high frequency radars where the wavelength of the radar is much smaller than the Debye radius. This is not typically the case. For frequencies commonly used for incoherent scatter radars, we need to account for the collective interactions between the constituents of plasma. In this case, the scattering cross-section per unit volume also needs to account for the electron temperature and the ion temperature. The equation that describes the radar cross-section per unit volume for typical incoherent scatter radar measurement situations is given by equation 11. You may have already encountered this equation when learning about the theory for incoherent scatter. I will refer you to Pogforce or Farley and Hogforce for more details. The incoherent scatter cross-section for ionospheric plasma is very small. If we add up all of the scattering contributions from all of the electrons within the volume of plasma, we obtain a total scattering cross-section given in equation 13. For example, if we assume an electron density of 10 to 12 electrons per cubic meter, for example, if we assume an electron density of 10 to 12 electrons per cubic meter, which is a relatively high electron density, a ratio of electron and ion temperature of 2, and a volume that is 10 cubic kilometers in size, we obtain a radar cross-section of only 3.3 times 10 to minus 7 square meters, with roughly a 0.6 millimeter side. We can compare this radar cross-section to a radar target which is thought to be nearly invisible by radar, the F-117 stealth fighter. The smallest reported radar cross-section for this that I found was 0.001 meters squared. This is a radar cross-section that is 3,000 times larger than the huge volume of ionospheric plasma that we just considered earlier. Radar scatter from ionospheric plasma is therefore very weak. An incoherent scatter radar capable of detecting ionospheric plasma would have no problem observing a stealth fighter. We can also estimate the amount of total power received using the radar equation. In this case, I've used the total radar cross-section of the ionospheric volume that we discussed earlier. Using a radar transmit power of 1 megawatt, an antenna cane of 10 to 4.8, an effective aperture size for the antenna of 400 square meters, and a range to volume of 200 kilometers, we obtained return power of roughly 10 to minus 17 watts. This is roughly 23 orders of magnitude less than the amount of power that we transmitted into the ionosphere. In radar jargon, a radar that has a co-located transmitter and receiver is called a monostatic radar. A radar that has a transmitter and receiver at different locations is called a bistatic radar. Most incoherent scatter radars are monostatic. However, the current ISCAT VHF system is tristatic, with two bistatic receivers in Finland and Sweden, in addition to the transmit-receive system in Tromsø, Norway. The new ISCAT 3D radar currently under construction will also have tristatic geometry. The main difference between monostatic and bistatic radars is how the scattering volume of plasma is defined, as well as polarization effects for the scattered signal that are present in a bistatic geometry. In the case of a monostatic radar, the volume is determined by the solid angle of the high gain portion of the radar antenna and the range extent 
of the rate of transmit pulse, which is defined by the speed of light, the length of the transmit pulse, and a factor of 2 accounting for the fact that the radar pulse needs to travel a round trip distance. In the case of bi-static radars, determining the scattering volume is more complicated. We'll focus the rest of this lecture on monostatic radar. Extending the results for bi-static geometries is possible, but would result in a more complicated expression for the scattering volume, which we want to avoid. In the case of monostatic radar, the equation describing received power is now given in equation 15. In this case, both ranges are equal, and the polarization term sine squared of chi is not present. The size of the volume illuminated by the radar depends on the solid angle of the high gain portion of the radar antenna. Basic antenna theory allows us to relate peak gain with the solid opening angle of the high gain portion of the radio antenna. We can also relate the gain of an antenna to the effective aperture of the same radio antenna. The cross-sectional area of the antenna beam is thus omega times r squared, where r is the distance to the scattering volume. If we multiply this with the range extent of a radar pulse, we obtain an expression for the volume illuminated by a highly directive antenna. Using the expression for the scattering volume as a function of range to target, antenna size, radar pulse length, and the wavelength, as well as expressing the transmit antenna gain using the antenna effective area, we can rewrite the radar equation in a more simple form. which is now given by equation 18. The most important realization that we can make using this equation is that the scattered power decreases inversely proportionally to r squared, not r to the power of 4. This behavior is common for all radar targets that are volume filling. The key radar performance parameters that define the scattered power are transmit power, antenna area, and radar pulse length. By increasing any of these, the received signal power will increase. The previous considerations only used peak gain. In order to obtain a more accurate radar equation, we need to include antenna gain at different directions. We can modify our original radar equation and deal with power received per solid angle. We'll also need to express the antenna area as a function of antenna gain. We'll use the fact that the scattering volume depends on the solid angle. Using these equations and differentiating the received power with respect to solid angle, we obtain equation 20. By integrating over solid angle, we obtain an expression for received power, which takes into account the antenna gain pattern. This is given in equation 21. In this case, we obtain an effective backscattered gain, g sub bs. This quantity is smaller than the peak gain. We can also relate this effective backscattered gain to an effective backscatter aperture, a sub bs, and arrive at equation 22. This equation has exactly the same form as the equation we derived earlier, except instead of the effective aperture of the antenna, we have an effective backscatter antenna area, A sub BS. Here are performance parameters for some selected incoherent scattered radars. What is common to all of these radars is that the transmit power and antenna gain is very high. For example, a gain of 48 dB means that the incident power delivered by the radar transmit antenna into the volume of plasma is nearly 100,000 times larger than it would be using an isotropic radiator. I will discuss system noise power characteristic later on. This is by far the most sensitive incoherent scatter radar in the world, the Arecibo Observatory 430 MHz incoherent scatter radar. It has a spherical reflector built into a valley with a diameter of 305 meters. This provides a huge collecting area for this radar. The radar can use two beams simultaneously, using the line feed in the Gregorian Dome. Unfortunately, the line feed was destroyed by Hurricane Maria in 2017 and has yet to be rebuilt. This instrument is also used extensively for radio astronomy and planetary radar. This is the Hikamarca Observatory radar, located in Peru on the outskirts of Lima. This radar operates at 49.92 MHz and has a very large phased array antenna, which is approximately 300 meters times 300 meters in size. The antenna, in fact, is slightly larger than the Arecibo Observatory dish. The instrument has been used for a wide range of studies of the equatorial ionosphere. The main speciality of this radar is the ability to observe perpendicular to the magnetic field, allowing observing strong radar echoes from magnetic field aligned irregularities. 
The radar can also be configured for performing radar imaging, as well as to observe the trajectories of meteor head echoes interferometrically. This is the Millstone Hill 440 MHz radar, which is located outside of Boston. The radar is operated by the MIT Haystack Observatory. The radar system has two antennas, a larger vertically pointing fixed antenna shown in the front and a steerable antenna shown on the background. The main speciality of this radar is that it can observe at very low elevations, allowing observing the ionosphere in a large geographic region while scanning the steerable antenna. This is the Kharkov Incoherence Scatter Radar in Ukraine, which has a similar vertical fixed pointing antenna as the Millstone Hill Radar. To my knowledge, this radar is still operational. The Poker Flat Radar is located in Alaska. This is the most technically modern incoherence scatter radar currently in use. It employs a phased array antenna allowing fast scanning of the antenna beam. Because the radar uses solid state transmitter technology, it can be operated unmanned. It operates continuously in low power mode, occasionally transitioning into high duty cycle mode for observation campaigns. The Poker Flat radar uses a center frequency of 450 MHz. The Resolute Bay radar, located in northern Canada, is a sister of the Poker Flat radar. It is located at the magnetic north pole. This radar can be used, for example, to observe ionospheric plasma convecting across the polar cap. The Resolute Bay radar also operates at a frequency of 450 MHz. The Icecut Svalbard radar is located in Longyearbyen. It is a 500 MHz radar and it also has two antennas, one fixed to the magnetic field line position and one steerable antenna. This radar is used for studies of the polar cap ionosphere. The Iska Tromso radars operate at 224 MHz and 930 MHz. The 930 MHz radar uses a 32 meter diameter steerable antenna. The 224 MHz radar can be scanned along the meridian from zenith to low elevation north. The size of the VHF antenna is approximately 40 meters times 120 meters. These radars are used for studies of the auroral oval. The Tromso site also hosts a wide range of other instruments, including an ionospheric heating facility. The Sondersham radar facility was the highest frequency incoherence scatter radar. It operated at 1090 MHz. This facility was unfortunately closed a few years ago. The radar was used for studies of the polar cap ionosphere. One of the special features of this radar was that it was very sensitive to enhanced plasma lines during auroral precipitation allowing very fast observations of electron density within Aurora. This is the Irkutsk radar located in Siberia, Russia. The radar is based on a ballistic missile radar. One of the special features of this radar is that it uses linear polarization for transmit, as the antenna is based on a slotted waveguide. The radar operates at frequencies between 150 and 200 MHz. ISCA 3D is a new tristatic radar system currently under construction. This radar will be similar to the American AMISER radars, Poker Flat and Resolute Bay. It will also use solid state transmitters and an electronically steerable phased array antenna. The radar will have tristatic receivers in Norway, Finland, and Sweden, allowing true vector ion velocity to be observed. This radar operates at a frequency of 233 MHz. When completed, this radar will be the most technically advanced radar in the world and can be used for a wide range of space research, including studies of the auroral ionosphere, meteors, and space debris. It is envisioned that this radar can also be used for discovery of near-Earth asteroids. The radar can also be used for observing the composition and structure of the surface of the Moon when used as a planetary radar. We are now almost done with deriving an expression for signal-to-noise ratio of an incoherent scatter radar. The only remaining part that is needed is system noise power. In addition to radar echoes, a radar system receives noise of cosmic origin, as well as noise generated by the radio receiver itself. Within a narrow frequency band, this noise can be modeled as white noise with a total power given by the Nyquist-Johnson noise model, which is the low frequency approximation for the Rayleigh-Jeans model. In this case, noise power is a product of the Boltzmann constant, K sub b, noise temperature, T, and the total noise bandwidth, b. We can model the system noise of an incoherent scatter radar as a sum of sky noise or noise of cosmic origin and receiver noise generated by the radio receiver of the radar. The figure on the right shows a plot of a model of system noise as a function of frequency, which includes noise temperature variation due to the noise temperature variation of cosmic radio noise 
and a fixed receiver noise temperature due to losses in the radio receiver, which typically do not vary as a function of frequency. This figure shows the distribution of cosmic radio noise at different positions within the sky based on the Haslam model for sky noise temperature. Cosmic radio noise is primarily generated by galactic synchrotron emission, and the main feature visible in this image is our own galaxy. This is essentially what the sky would look like if you could look at it with eyes that were sensitive to 408 MHz. The cosmic radio noise is frequency dependent. The dependence on frequency is shown in equation 24. When making an anispheric measurement, lower frequencies will have more receiver noise power due to the frequency characteristics of cosmic radio noise. Here is an example of system noise temperature measured using the two antennas at the Millstone Hill incoherent scatter radar. The red line denotes the vertical fixed position antenna. Once a day, the antenna transits Cygnus A, a very bright radio source. This causes an increase in system noise while the radio source is in the high gain portion of the antenna beam. The system noise also occasionally can be increased due to man-made radio interference. The Millstone Hill radar is located in a somewhat urban environment near Boston, and oftentimes the system noise will be increased also due to radio transmissions that occur in the frequency band of the radar. This can be seen by comparing the dark and light traces, which show the median and mean measurements of receiver noise. Sporadic interference is seen in the mean estimate, but not so much in the median estimate, which is not as sensitive to occasional increases in receiver noise. Here is another example. The Hickelmarker radar uses a very low frequency of 49.92 MHz. Therefore, the cosmic radio noise is more powerful for this radar due to the sky noise power dependence on frequency. The plot shows measured radar echo power using the Hickelmarker radar over 24 hours. At earlier hours of the day, the galactic plane is overhead and above the Hickelmarker radar. At this time, the receiver noise power increases by a factor of 10, which is seen as noisier estimates of scattered power. In order to estimate the ratio of anispheric echo power to receiver noise power, we will need to define receiver bandwidth. This needs to be at least enough to fit the online portion of the incoherent scatter radar spectrum. The online spectral width is proportional to the Doppler shift that corresponds to the ion thermal width, and therefore bandwidth is wavelength dependent. This means that higher frequency radars need to use more receiver bandwidth than lower frequency radars, and thus they will also have higher receiver noise power. We now have an expression for signal-to-noise ratio, assuming that we are observing the ion-line portion of the incoherent scatter spectrum. This is given by equation 26. Let's return to our previous example where we estimated the amount of received power from a volume of ionospheric plasma to be 3.3 times 10 to minus 17 watts. If we now assume that we had used a radar with a frequency of 930 MHz, corresponding to a 32 centimeter wavelength, we obtain a minimum required bandwidth of 20 kHz for the ion line. Using a system noise temperature of 100 Kelvin, we obtain a noise power of 2.8 times 10 to minus 17 watts. This results in a signal to noise power ratio of roughly 1. This means that there is roughly the same amount of receiver noise power as ionospheric echo power. The equation for signal to noise ratio does not imply that longer wavelengths have better signal to noise ratio. We need to also factor in the wavelength dependence of receiver noise due to the frequency dependence of cosmic radio noise. For long wavelengths or low frequencies, the cosmic radio noise power dominates the equation for signal to noise ratio. The asymptotic behavior for long wavelengths is shown in equation 29. For short wavelengths or high frequencies, the receiver noise dominates, and the asymptotic behavior is shown in equation 30. The different asymptotic behaviors for long and short wavelengths indicates that there is an optimal frequency for incoherent scatter radars, where the signal-to-noise ratio is maximized, assuming that the power, antenna area, and pulse length are kept constant. The range of frequencies that are most optimal for incoherent scatter radars are between 50 and 2000 MHz, with a peak of normalized signal-to-noise ratio approximately at 400 MHz. It is therefore not a coincidence that many of the incoherent scatter radars are close to this frequency. Note that this consideration does not include the by length effects, which come to play for higher frequency radars. While it is possible to analytically relate received echo power to electron density based on radar performance parameters, this is not done in practice. 
many of the radar performance parameters change over time or are otherwise not known well enough. Instead, a calibration procedure is used, which equates most of the terms in the radar equation to a so-called magic constant, shown in equation 31. Using this magic constant, we can relate the received signal-to-noise power ratio and the system temperature to electron density using the relation shown in equation 32. The parameters T sub E and Ti, the electron and ion temperatures, can be obtained by fitting plasma parameters to the measured autocorrelation function. We only need to determine the magic constant gamma for one range and one time. In other words, we need to know the electron temperature, ion temperature, and electron density for at least one range in order to estimate gamma. We also need to keep track of the system noise temperature. This is done in practice by using a noise injection procedure that involves a noise diode. A calibration value for true electron density at some range is needed. This can be obtained using an ionosond plasma lines or by using Faraday rotation. An ionosond is a high frequency radar which measures total reflection of radio waves from ionospheric plasma. When the transmitted frequency encounters a region of the ionosphere where the in situ plasma frequency equals the transmitted frequency, a total reflection occurs. The highest frequency for which we obtain a return will then correspond to the peak electron density of the ionosphere. This frequency typically corresponds to the F region peak electron density. Plasma lines are the best form of calibration for incoherent scatter radar because the plasma line frequency does not depend strongly on other plasma parameters. It is therefore not unusual to measure electron density to within a fraction of a percent using plasma lines. Here is an example measurement of plasma lines obtained using the Arecibo Observatory radar. Plasma lines can typically only be measured during the daytime as a photoelectron enhancement is needed in order for the plasma line power to be high enough to be detectable using the radar. The Arecibo radar, however, can observe plasma lines also during the night using a long pulse mode. Finally, Faraday rotation is another possible way for absolute calibration of electron density. For this, the radar needs to be able to use a linearly polarized transmit signal or to transmit O and X mode interleavedly. The appleton hartree equation provides two different refractive indices for two modes of propagation, which typically correspond to circular polarizations. This allows the phase difference between the O and X mode echoes to be related to the line integral of electron density along the path of propagation. When measuring this phase as a function of range, it is possible to invert the electron density profile. The Hikamarka and the Irkutsk incoherent scatter radars use Faraday rotation information for absolute calibration. Alright, that's it for today. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them when I come back from skiing.